Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. With the turn of each page, words spill out. Teaching, instructing, challenging. The words arrange, gather, and speak. They become etched into our reality. Faith turns into action until it becomes not only a part of our lives, but a new way to live altogether. Good morning. How are you today? Um, welcome online. If you're joining us, we're glad to have you. We are in a new series. We just started last week, Encouraging Words. Last week we talked about not giving up. Today we're going to be talking about defeating your doubts, getting, I mean, everybody has doubts, and so getting the best of those, not letting them get the best of us. I mean, we all struck, that's, that's pretty universal. We all have doubts about things, right? We, hey, should I have done that? We kind of second guess ourselves. Should I take this back? Or should I not count, you know, should I cancel that contract? And we're, we're, we second guess ourselves. We're Monday morning quarterbacking doubts. When we doubt about our future, we call that worry, right? When we doubt about other people, we call that suspicion. When we have doubts about ourselves, we call that inferiority. When we doubt God, we call that unbelief, right? When we doubt television, we call that intelligence. <laughs> I don't think I believe that. When we, when we doubt everything, we're really, a, you know, that's cynicism, right? And skepticism. Men typically have doubts especially as they get into their midlife, the midlife doubt, right, the crisis, when they start to doubt their, their virility, their ability, and even their senility, you know, and the, the, three, the three Bs, you know, bifocals, baldness, and bulges. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that can cause us to doubt and uh, get down. And what we see this in Scripture, look with me, the first uh, verse on your outline says, for a doubtful mind... Some of us have that, right? It's a doubtful mind will be unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And every decision you then make will be uncertain as you turn first this way and then that. Isn't that so frustrating? You, you're, you're stuck. A lot of people are paralyzed in their doubts. They just don't know what to do. They don't know, do I go forward? Do I go left? Do I go right? Now, should Christians doubt? Is it okay for a Christian to doubt? Well, certainly Doubts affect everybody, including Christ followers. Notice what Paul says there in 2 Corinthians. Read with me. He says, we are often troubled, but not crushed. Sometimes in doubt, but never in despair. There are many enemies, but we are never without a friend. And though we badly hurt at times, we are not destroyed. Now he's talking about the church at work when we're praying for one another, when we're encouraging one another. He goes, despite that, though, you're still going to have struggles. You're still going to have doubts. And Paul then goes on and he lists some pretty challenging, even horrific things that happened to him, which is why he was saying, hey, I got down to the lowest point, but I, I didn't, you know, there was always a place where God was able to help me and other people would come alongside. So today what I want to do is look at three causes of doubt. What, what are the things that kind of sideline us and get us uh, off kilter? And then we're going to talk about how do we handle it? What do we do to overcome them? Number, so let's start with number one things that that uh that cause us to doubt would be critics critics certainly can do that a critic comes into your life and they're uh you know they they uh they make fun of you you might have that at work or at school certainly you've had people that maybe they 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 say you know you're stupid for what you believe uh, and they see you carrying a bible or reading the bible they go, oh that's so dumb you believe in that and then they make fun of you and it, all of a sudden it starts to cause us to doubt it reminds me of the little the young man who was in school, and uh, his teacher says, well, I can't understand the Bible. I don't think anybody should read the Bible. It doesn't make any sense. It's confusing, and I can't understand it. So this young man, he raises his hand. He goes, hey, listen. He goes, really, the Bible is God's love letter to his people. He goes, that's what you get for reading other people's mail. <laughs> okay, well, wow. I guess it wasn't. I thought it was funny, but I guess I laughed at myself. Psalm 73 says this, they scoff at God 
how proudly they speak. You know, so often, uh, you know, people, they get arrogant, you know, like they're, like there's, you know, that and then some. And so God's people are dismayed and confused and they drink it all in. God, does God really know what he's going on? They ask. And this happens, right? Critics cause us to doubt. Uh, we start to second get, we drink it all in, all of that condom, condemning stuff, condescending stuff. They, and, it, you know, the Bible actually says that the fool in his heart says that there is no God, which means that no matter how smart or educated somebody is, if they don't believe in God, the Bible says they're a fool. They're the ones that are foolish. And they go around arrogant with their, with their head cocked back, like there's all, you know, but really they're, they're the ones that are the fool. Okay, so I'm going to try another one, right? Here we go. <laughs> it's like the lady who every morning she'd get out on her porch and she would just say, oh, praise God. And uh, it, a neighbor moves in, some guy, and he's an atheist. And he hears her saying that. And so every time she yells it, he yells out, there is no God. So every morning, this goes on for a while. Praise God, there is no God. So she, he overhears here her praying for groceries so he goes i'm gonna go get her some groceries he gets her two big bags of groceries puts them at her front doorstep then hides behind the hedges she opens up the door she goes praise god god provided me this food and he jumps out and he goes god didn't provide that for you there is no god i bought these groceries for you she goes praise god god provided groceries and had the devil pay for it <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, there's people that will scoff. They'll stand behind the hedges. They'll, they'll try to whittle us down, cause us to doubt ourselves. This is nothing new. We see this, you know, in the Bible. David said again and again, they scoff. Where is your God? Where is this God of yours? But, oh, my soul, don't be discouraged. Don't be upset. Expect God to act. And so when the scoffer tries to get you down, you just go, hey, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to get discouraged. See, the, the, it's true. They don't like people that, that are scoffers. They don't like a joyful Christian. They want everybody to be as miserable as them. And you don't have to fall into that. So certainly critics can cause us to doubt. Secondly, our conscience. Our conscience causes us to doubt. In other words, we start feeling guilty, and then we... We start doubting what we believe. We start rationalizing what we believe so that it fits our lifestyle. First Timothy says, For some people have disobeyed their consciences and have deliberately done what they knew was wrong. It isn't, uh, it isn't surprising that soon they are lost their faith in Christ after, de after defying God like that. So we have a guilty conscience. And then when we have a guilty conscience, we... We, we start rationalizing. It's like somebody, you know, gets a ticket on the interstate and then they're all upset. And, you know, I don't believe in the state police. I don't believe in the courts or the magistrates. I don't believe in the 55 mile an hour speed limit. I didn't change any of that. You're just frustrated. You're, you know, you're, you're justifying your behavior because you don't, I mean, this is, the, this is the law. And so what happens is we, we know what's wrong and then we violate it and then we feel bad and so then we start saying, hey, I'm going to, I'll try to change my beliefs. I had a, a young man once say, hey, Andy, I don't believe in God. And he thought that would shock me. I said, uh, I said, well, you know, why, what, what, what kind of God do you not believe in? He goes, well, I don't believe in a God would do this and this and this. I said, well, so you're telling me that if you did believe in God, that, that you would have to change some of your lifestyle. And he goes, well, certainly there's things I'm doing that I would have to change. I said, well, that's really brilliant. Really, that's the issue there. The issue is not that you don't believe in God. It's that you don't, you don't want to have to change your lifestyle because if, if you put your faith in God, you, that's going to have consequences. And this is often what's going on is, is that, that, uh, that people that don't want to change their lifestyles, don't want to change, they know, understand that has a consequence. This, they, they just go, well, I don't, I don't want to be part of that. So it causes us to doubt our conscience. We have a conscience that says, hey, you're, you shouldn't be doing that. So circ critics, circumstances, you know, the circumstances is the third one. That's really the, 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 most, uh, the most intense, really, and also often the most common because we have tragedy that strikes. We have hardships that come our way. We have unanswered prayer. We face impossible situations, and it causes us to doubt. There's a story about the disciples where they're, 
uh, Jesus and the disciples are in a boat. They're on the, the Lake of Galilee. Uh, a big storm whips up, and they notice Jesus is asleep in the stern, which I think is quite remarkable because the boats really weren't that big back then. And I've been on a boat in a big storm. It's terrifying. I would not sleep. But Jesus is like asleep. He's like totally in this place of trust, no doubt. And he's probably exhausted from the ministry he does. And so the disciples, they come and they wake him up and they go, hey, don't you care if we perish? And see, what happens is when, when we're in difficult circumstances, we start to doubt God's, that he cares for us, that he loves us, that he's, that he's looking out for us. It causes, a, that's the typical reaction, right, when we're under pressure. Gallup says that, 89% of Americans believe in God, but really if you, deal, if you drill down, what kind of God do they believe in? Do they believe in a personal God, a God who cares for you, a God who knows you by name, is looking after you, a God who's powerful enough to change your circumstances? I mean, all of those things, see, that's, that's not what they're surveying, a God that can be depended on. It changes everything. And so those are, you know, certainly critics will cause us to doubt you know, what's, what's happening in our lives. And we have, we have uh, circumstances that, that, that affect us as well and, uh, and our conscience. Now, here, let, on, let me show you some, some suggestions from God's Word on how to handle doubts. Number one is, is admit your doubts. The Bible's always uh, real uh, uh, forthright about being honest, that honesty has a real value because you can't really get anywhere if you're not honest with yourself. So you just kind of have to be honest. And, and if you're some, sometimes if you're a Christian and you think you have doubts, you start to think, oh, no, that's, I'm a bad person. I'm a bad Christian if I have doubts. But yet we see in, in, in all throughout the Bible and really church history that really it's going through our doubts that strengthens our faith. Amen. You know, so, so doubts is something that we, that we, that we uh, have to work through. Everybody has doubts. John the Baptist, you know, Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest man who ever lived, and yet he had doubts. He had a great ministry. He, uh, he prophesied Jesus. He prayed over Jesus as the Messiah. He, he baptized Jesus. And yet, at a different point in his life, later on in his life, the ebb of his ministry was at a low point. He was in prison, and he was suffering, and he starts to have doubts. He starts thinking, wow, well, you know, and he sends a message to Jesus. Did I get something wrong? Or, you know, are, are you the Messiah? He's not, he's not even sure at this point. Notice this, when, G, when John heard it in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect somebody else? And yet John was the one who prophesied it up front. And, and, and you know what Jesus does? He sends the disciples back to encourage John to lift his spirits he, he doesn't condemn them. He doesn't make them feel bad. He turns to the, after they leave, he turns to the, to the group that are still there and he says, he's the greatest guy who's ever lived. And here he's in his place of greatest doubt. See, we normally wouldn't think that. We'd think, oh, you know, I'm doubting, so God's got to be disappointed with me. No, actually, so you see this as, you know, John the Baptist experiencing a lot of doubt. Thomas is another example. You, doubting Thomas. He's one of Jesus' disciples. He was not there when Jesus was raised from the dead and he visited the disciples. First, the, some of the women saw him and then he went to the men. They're the disciples, but Thomas wasn't among them. So he's like really put out. He's saying, he comes back and they go, oh, Thomas, you missed it. Jesus was here, resurrected. Trans it was just, his body was transformed. It was amazing. Well, he's not all out. He's thinking, no. I, I'm not going to, you know, he starts doubting. That's where he gets, you know, doubting Thomas. He says, no, no, no. Unless I see him, unless I can put my fingers on his wounds, no way. And you know what happens? You know how Jesus turned doubting Thomas into believing Thomas? A personal encounter. He showed up. And this is what happens to us. When we, when we're struck, when we have our doubts and we're waylaid by our doubts, what we need is a personal encounter from God. And it changes things. It changes things. This is certainly what happened with Thomas. Again, with Thomas, he didn't, when, when he showed up, he didn't go, hey, Thomas, I tested you just for a few days and look at where you're at, man. You've got, you know, they start criticizing him and harassing him, making him feel bad, condemning him. Jesus didn't do any of that. See, the message of Thomas being restored was that even in his doubts, God loved him. 
God demonstrated his love. He didn't forsake him. He didn't forget him. That's the point of that. God keeps loving us. Jude 1.22 says, be merciful to those who doubt. That's what God is to us, and that's how we're supposed to be to one another. See, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is just, you know, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not sure what God has for me. Unbelief is, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not doing it. We kind of dig our heels in. But he says, no, when you're in doubt, he says, be, God demonstrates mercy, and we're supposed to be merciful to one another because it, it bursts our, our faith. David in the Psalms, you see doubt coming through when he says, God, you know, how long until you rescue me? You know, how can you let these bad things happen to good people? I mean, you see this all throughout the Psalms. It's pretty gut-wrenching when you really read the Bible, or read the Psalms, and you slow down and let, you think, this, this guy's going through some serious doubt. Job, do you have the same thing? Job is known for the person who went through all that suffering. All those things were taken away from him, his health and his business. Even his kids were, were, were killed by terrorists and by uh, tornadoes. And, and he's, you know, in this terrible place. And we know this about Job. This is what makes him uh, infamous. But what Job is, the, the letter is whenever Job has a chance to talk in, in, in the letter of Job, he just says, you know, he just cries out, God, are you still powerful can you still redeem me? Can you still help with this stuff? I mean, can you still change things in my life? Do you love me? How would you, you have let all this stuff happen? And it's, he's doubting. And yet in the end of that book, see, God, he restores him. We read that God comes and ushers in his power, his love. He restores Job. Abraham doubted. He's their father, the father of our faith. He's doubted. He, God told him, he, he gave him a promise that you're going to have a child from, from your own flesh and that's going to be the child of promise that will bring the, the, the Israel and uh, bless the world, through the, through the na- bless all the nations. <laughs> so here he's 100, you know, and he's thinking, that's pretty old to be waiting for a kid. His wife, Sarah, was 90. She still hadn't had a child. And so God tells him, you're going to have a child. Sarah, she's, so Abraham, he doubts. Sarah doubts. She, and when she hears that, you know, she's going to have a, her first child at 90, she laughs. In fact, she, she's going to name her child Laughter, which is Isaac. We know that she doubted because if a 90-year-old woman is told she's going to have a baby, she does not laugh, she cries. <laughs> <laughs> there's no doubt, there's, there's doubt there, you know. So we have to, we have doubts, right? And that's part of it. So what do we do? Well, we want to admit our doubts. Number two is you doubt your doubts. We tend to do the opposite, right? We believe our doubts, and we doubt what we believe. But what we need to do is believe what we believe, put our faith in that, and then doubt the doubts. Not the opposite. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. So we, sometimes we don't understand. See, that's what causes us to doubt. He says, no, even if you don't understand, don't lean on that. Instead, trust in the Lord. That's where what will get you through things. And so the, really the question is, when we, when we don't understand, what do we, we're kind of left with our feelings, right? And so let me ask you, do you listen to God's word or do you listen to your feelings? Because your feelings might tell you something that's not right. I mean, right? The feelings, we can't always trust those. Your feelings might tell you, you're not loved. I don't feel loved. I don't feel cared for. I don't feel appreciated. I don't feel like God's going to be there for me. I don't feel like, I don't feel forgiven. And if you let your feelings dictate your belief, you're going to be, just fall into a, an abyss of doubt because that's where that will lead you. You can't just let your doubts lead the way. I mean, and, and, and let your feelings lead your doubts, which will lead the way. When we have difficult circumstances, and they're lengthy, it causes us to start to feel bad, doubt ourselves. Think of the, uh, the promise that was given way back to Abraham. Abraham was given a promise that, you're, that uh, he said, God said, your people will go to Egypt, they'll be there for 400 years, they'll even endure slavery, but they will come back, they'll be restored. So this was given before before he even had children, I mean, just early on. He just knew this, wrote it down, passed it down. And so if you know the story, uh, the, the Abraham's great uh, grandchild uh, grew up 
actually great great grandfather, uh, great uh, or grand, great grandson, uh, Joseph was became the Pharaoh there, rescued his family. They all are the second to, to the Pharaoh. Excuse me. All of the the Israelites ended up moving to Egypt, and then they end up in slavery for four hundred years, and then God raises up Moses. And when Moses comes, they're not like, oh, yeah, this is so awesome. No, they've been in this terrible situation for so long, they doubt. They go, I don't know, Moses. You don't look like you got the goods. (laughs) And by himself, he didn't, of course. And then the ten plagues came. The hardship of that, four of those plagues happened, and it affected Goshen. It affected them as well. Then they go, they get released, and they're like trapped there at the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is coming at them. And they're trapped, and they doubt there. But God rescues them. The Red Sea opens up. They go through into the desert. And now they're about to go into the promised land, and they doubt again. And because of that, they end up being in the desert for 40 years. And then they have doubts all throughout Numbers, which describes this wilderness experience in the desert. They're doubting over and over, just struggling with that. And then finally, they get into the promised land And they're able to, you know, fulfill this promise that was given to Abraham 450 years before, way, way before. And and then Joshua stands in front of the leaders, and I I love this. Notice what he says. Now, all this has happened, and here's what he says. He says, you know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled, not one has failed. Now, was that true? Yeah, it was, but... It came at a cost. I mean, when there was a promise, it's just like, well, now you have to go through all of this to make that happen. God's promise was, you're going to have a land, you're going to, I'm going to lead you to a land of milk and honey. But what that meant was, they're going to have to milk cows and they're going to get stung by some bees. (laughs) Right? I mean, it's going to be difficult. But God's presence was there all along. He was, he was there in the plagues protecting them. He was there at the Red Sea. When they were thirsty in the desert, he would make water come out of rocks. He would rain out of the sky manna for them to eat. He would give them quail for them to eat. He sustained their clothes. He provided for them when they had to do things at night and it was pitch dark. There was a pillar of fire there to give them light, to guide them by day. There was a pillar of cloud. There was their, the tabernacle, the, the tent that was their constant uh, the presence of God to remind them God is with them he parted the Jordan River at at flood season for them to go through he the walls of Jericho came falling down he helped them by even having uh, astronomical things like the sun standing I mean God's presence was here over and over and over even though it was difficult so it was certainly there was plenty of things for them to doubt if they just left it to their feelings but they could also look and say, you know what, I'm going to look for God's presence, evidence of God's presence. God is fulfilling. And so, see, when Joshua could say this, he fulfilled them all he did. It just took, it just took a while. Notice Hebrews says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So when God tells you to do something, we can say, I know God's faithful. He will come through. I don't have to have it all figured out. I might not have it all the understanding connected. But I can still trust in God. You know, just because you don't understand something doesn't mean you, you, you can't move forward and do something. I don't understand how the digestive system works. But it doesn't stop me from eating. Right? So we don't always understand everything. But it doesn't mean we can't move forward. And then number three is begin with faith. In other words, you begin with the faith that you already have even if it's just a little. Now, Jesus addresses this because we often tend to think we need huge, gargantuan faith to do something, even small. You need big faith for something small. We get it reversed. Jesus said this. Uh, it, now, in Mark 9 is a story of, of a man who is, his, he's a father, his son is sick. And so he goes to Jesus and he says, hey, could you heal my son? And Jesus says, yeah, no problem according to your faith, you know, by your, you know, you, I'll, I'll heal him if you have faith. And here's this guy's response. He says, Lord, I do believe, help me to overcome my unbelief. So that's his response. He goes, basically, he says, uh, yeah, I believe, but I also have doubts. Now, can you have both? Can you doubt and believe at the same time? You can, right? You can have both. 
You, you, can know for, you can know that God's called you to do something and still be scared, scared out of your wits. Right? Because courage is moving despite your fears. It doesn't mean you don't have fear. And so God calls us. He says, he says he, we have to step forward and, and trust that God's with the little belief that we have. With, sometimes it's just so small. You go, Andy, I have so many doubts. How can God bless that? Well, he does. You know, he did to this, to this kid. He said, that's good enough for me. And he healed that kid. He healed that kid. And then we see in this last verse where uh, Jesus talks about how small faith can do big things if it's in the right place. He says, if you, this is Jesus, if you have faith as small as the mustard seed, one of the smallest seeds out there, nothing will be impossible to you. In the middle of that, it says, you can move this mountain. You can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved. In other words, we can, we can move mountains. Now, this is how we generally think of this, is if we, have, if we have faith as big as a mountain, we can move a mustard seed. We would get it reversed. But that's not what Jesus says. He goes, no, it's the smallest seed, the smallest amount put in the right thing. See, it's not how big our faith is. It's what we put our faith in. It's how big the thing is that you put your faith in. So if you have a big God, even though you have small faith, the result is big results. Big results. So it's the smallest amount of faith. That's good news. That's good news for us because many of us struggle with that. We just have just this, a minuscule amount. Mustard seed, faith. You go, well, Andy, what can I do with that? I still have all these doubts. My doubts are way bigger than my... Well, that's, so, so was his father's. He had all of these doubts. He goes, help me with my unbelief. This is a good prayer. When you go to God, you go, God, in my life right now, I have a lot of things coming at me. You know, I have a lot of doubts that try to, try to sabotage me, pull me down. Maybe it's doubting yourself. That's a, certainly a, a, a doubt that a lot of us have. Maybe other people, you look at your circumstances and you go, wow, what am, what am I going to do? Listen, you need to be honest about this. Be honest and, and admit your doubts. And say, you know, do you have doubts in, do you have, in God's love for you? When God says he loves you? Do you Because when we're in a difficult spot, we're thinking it doesn't feel very loving. Those are doubts. They're actually legitimate doubts. Or do you doubt that God's power is available to you? You're going, hey, man, I've been praying for this over and over, and I don't see anything happening. Do you doubt God's forgiveness? If you have lived a, a, did some things in your life that you're not all that proud of, actually, just frankly, you're ashamed of, and You've asked God to forgive you, and yet you still feel these unforgiveness. You feel shame. And God says, no, when you confess your sins, he says he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all, all unrighteousness. Certainly the enemy will try to come in and condemn you. That's why the Bible says there is no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. So you remind yourself of that. You go, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to just lay in that mire of doubt. What about God's faithfulness? Do you doubt God's faithfulness? That his promises are true? Sometimes you have to go through some hardship. Sometimes it takes a while. But it does not mean that God is not faithful. God is always faithful. He says that even though every man is a liar, God be, is true. So we can trust in God's faithfulness. He is faithful to us. He is faithful to us. So when we're in our doubts, we're in that kind of, that, those throes of that, you go, what am I, how do I, how do I make that all happen? Well, listen, I know sometimes people say, Andy, I can't get baptized because I have too many doubts. Listen, you get, if you're waiting around till you start a ministry or make an important decision, uh, move forward spiritually until your doubts are all resolved, you're not going to go anywhere. What happens is you start moving and then you start putting your confidence in God and then your doubts start to subside. That's how you resolve that. You don't just stay stuck and paralyzed. Like what James said is, is you're like that sea, you're tossed to and fro and you can't make a decision. You step forward and you say, I'm going to make a decision on the little amount of faith I have and then watch your confidence grow. Watch as God blesses that and all of a sudden mountain moving faith 
ha- starts happening. It's not your own faith, but it's what you put it in. When you put your faith in Christ, God has the power to raise his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. He says that same power is available when we have something that looks like it's all done. It's, we, we've lost hope. God says, we put our faith in that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, everybody has faith. It certainly has everything to do with what we put our faith in. Some of you are struggling with doubts. Maybe you're wondering. You're saying, you know, I don't know if I could believe in God. I don't know if I could believe in Jesus. Maybe you're wondering, I don't know if I'm good enough. How could God love me? Maybe you're holding out, becoming a Christ follower. Because you're thinking if you commit your life to God that you end up maybe embarrassed because you can't follow through. And that doubt. But the good news is it's not based on your faithfulness. It's based on God's faithfulness. You take a step forward. You take a step of faith and put your faith in Christ and watch what happens. Would you do that? Say, God, I want to put my faith in you today. The little amount of faith I have. Help me to help me to realize that you love me. You have power to change my circumstances. You care about me. You're faithful. And then just pray this prayer. We say, Jesus Christ, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. Just say that right now where you're at. I want to believe. Help my unbelief. You say, Jesus Christ, today I want to follow you. So as much as I know how, I ask you to come into my life. I don't understand it all. I'm not going to wait for, me, for all of my understanding. And I'm not going to wait on my feelings. Because they certainly will guide me in a place that is not, is not in always the right way. So would you say, today, Lord. Reveal yourself to me and rescue me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.